Next up, we have our guest speaker, very interesting guy, uh, Mr. Yog Zuki. Uh, he's a chief coffee drinker. Literally, coffee is his thing. Um, he's a Swiss investor and entrepreneur in Africa since 2007. He's a failed banker. Um, he's told me his story a lot about how many times he's failed. Um, just a little worried why they said failed banker here. This guy has failed one about six times, or if I remember properly. He's a founder and chief coffee drinker at Hello Healthcare, a primary health group whose aim is to become Africa's leading healthcare company. He can be found drinking virtual coffee and real coffee. Uh, what for virtual is on LinkedIn. Uh, Twitter, you can just check him out, is uh, at YZP. Uh, for those who will be checking out on Twitter, let's continue tweeting. So on Twitter, he's at YZP. Sometimes he has blogs about entrepreneurs, but doubt anybody reads about it. Uh, I see his blogs now and again on Facebook, on Twitter. Yeah, I do post them a little bit. He has worked in numerous locations, um, Hong Kong, Dubai, Frankfurt, London, Boston, literally like a lot of whole bunch of places. And has worked for very interesting companies like uh, Goldsash and uh, Oppenheimer. But I'll just let the man come up on stage. I hope his coffee is ready. Uh, <laughs> all right, Mr. York Zuki. So, a little bit background about me. I'll give, I'll keep it to 45 seconds, and then we go into the discussion about funding, how to go about getting funding, how to pitch your business, and by that I don't mean what the guys and girls did tonight here, but about asking for money. How much money do you ask? How do you position it? And because the equity itself, it becomes then a little bit irrelevant how much money you're getting for how much percentage in your company. So these are the kind of topics, and I'll make it a very short thing, probably five to eight minutes maximum, and then the rest, if you don't mind, depending on your interest, we make it an engaging process. <coughs> so that it, whenever if there's something burning on your heart with the greatest of pleasure, put it on the table so I can pass it to somebody who actually knows what they're talking about. Okay, no sense of humor tonight. Dead. <laughs> More coffee needed. Just a very brief background. My name is York. I'm from Switzerland originally. I've worked and lived in many countries around the world. I've worked actually for nine different companies. I got fired five times. Two of the times I quit just before they could fire me. And two of the times I made a little bit of money to enable me one day to quit, pack my luggage, and decide to become an entrepreneur. That was in the days where I was working with Jim O'Neill, who created the acronym BRICS. And he said, you know what, York, you are a ship employee. Why don't you try your hand at building your own business? I said, but what do I do and where do I go? He said, try Africa, it's a next frontier. In the typical arrogant European kind of way. You know, there's Africa, let's go pack our bags and we know everything. So of course I came here, that was The Economist in 2007, when The Economist said, Africa, the hopeless continent. I love that. I get excited when I hear things like that, because usually the press is wrong or extremely outdated. So if you read something, if you are in whatever sector you're in, and it's saying that it's a hot sector, and you should be in that sector, get out of it quickly. That's usually the time when it's, uh, you're going to be you're going to have too much competition. Anyhow, I came to South Africa and of course I know everything. I opened a little glass office, did all the important things, and failed five businesses within nine months. So if you ever need advice on growing your business, listen to what I say and do exactly the opposite. You're guaranteed success. And I really, then I started burning cash, and I had a bit of cash, of course, from my, say, from my days at working, but it wasn't money to buy myself a car every month. It was money to say, right, for five years, I don't need to, um, to earn an income per se. Of course, when you have that approach to life, you start burning cash immediately, you hire people, you start building th things left, right, and center. That's a different story. So lesson in life, keep your costs down, which is why the chief coffee drinker came about. It was, you know what, I was spending so much money going out for lunches and dinner, but I said, I can only afford coffee from now on. So I started just meeting people for coffee. And I tell you what, my energy level went sky high. I'm like, I'm going more. But the sixth business, the one that I thought was an absolutely stupid idea, was something called Hello Health. And I'm going to speak much about it. 
which started again in end 2008 and today employs as a cooperative roughly 3,000 people across the continent. Now we are a healthcare group in primary healthcare, that's clinics, rural clinics, nurses, software systems and so forth. I'm not going to say that, but the essence of why the business was successful was just because I learned to share what I was doing and learn how to work together. Don't worry if you're, you think you're sitting on the hottest idea in the world. Share. Get brands ambassadors out there. Make sure people know about you. In this stage of your business, and unless there's some multinational CEO here, in this stage of your business, it doesn't matter. There are competitors out there. Go and get yourself a couple of clients. Start making some money so that you can start paying the bills. That's all that matters. And don't worry if the macroeconomics are not right or you could be copied or your IP protection is, is wobbly or somebody somewhere else is doing it very similar. We live in a world of imperfect information. Sometimes meeting somebody and saying, you know what, this is what I do, generates a sale and you've got to build that relationship. When we are people, we tend to stick, even no matter how bad the service is up to a point, we tend to stick with each other for a very long time. So anyway, sorry, that was uh, wandering off. But it does lead to, to the point of the topic of tonight, which is you are building a business. And I don't know what you Actually, give me by show of hands. How many of you are aspiring entrepreneurs? Don't have a business yet, don't even have a clue really what you're going to do. Haven't started, probably working somewhere else or in the meantime. Cool, honestly. <laughs> <laughs> well, <laughs> uh, there was a hint, right? There must have been something between the lines. Um, how many of you have got, when I say small businesses, I'm talking about your, you are the business. You might have a client, you might still be struggling. Okay, quite a few of you. And how many of you have, let's say, five to ten employees and are really making it? Compliments? Compliments? Um, well done. Okay, so there's a mixture, but they, with a heavy tendency towards real startup. So the idea of valuing your business, if you'll allow me, is absolutely stupid. For example, I, I sh you know, with all the swearing tonight, maybe I shouldn't, but I chair the finance committee here at the Innovation Hub on two funds for entrepreneurs. One is a startup support fund and one is a climate innovation fund. And I do a lot of other advisory work for European investment houses want to come to Africa. Leaving that aside, so I sit on both sides of the fence. At your stage, when you are going out for funding, and remember, there's not just the funding mechanisms like the Innovation Hub, like the IDC, or what other funding mechanisms are there. There's quite a few actually, but there's also corporates that might want, for example, in your case with the what you, what's the technical term? Sandblaster. With a sandblaster. You might, incorporate, you might go to a company that has a vast array of services and fit your service in that company, and that's called corporate venture capital. And it's much more readily available than you can imagine. The problem is you never know who to speak to uh, in those companies. That's when networking kicks in. That's the one side. There's something called angel investors as well. Those are people with a bit of savings, but they are very risk averse. So the idea of a con of investing in a startup means they've got to sell their children down the line. <laughs> Some of them are actually not completely averse to that idea. They're probably welcome. <laughs> <laughs> Guys, I, I told you, my jokes are shit. <laughs> no, but here's the thing. There is money out there. But the problem is that we usually approach and go out to get funding when we are already desperate when the bills are running high, when you're already borrowed from fools, friends and families, and they added additional family members uh, by invitation. So the point is, you've got to start this relationship with the potential funders very, very early. Involve them in your business, whether as a mentor, whether you all this trick in the book. You know, you sit there, what's your business? Oh, fantastic, you know what? I am in a similar business to you. Would you mind sparing me an hour once a month just to help me guide the ship, whether I'm going in the right direction or what I'm doing. Or maybe you say to somebody who's got a big office, do you mind if I can just use one corner of your office and your Wi-Fi? I promise I'll be silent. 
just by virtue of being there, you will get business, you will get leads, they'll start liking you, and in hopefully, um, uh, they'll start liking you, maybe making an introduction, there'll be other people walking through the offices, you'll get more business, and it might just turn out that they personally start investing in you, because now the barriers are down. So now comes the question, but then how much should I ask for? What's my business worth? Who cares? You're not, you know, you're not in the stage of business where you are being bought out. So whether the back evaluation, if I say I'm investing in your business and you say it's worth 10 million, and I say it's worth 1 million, well, it doesn't matter because you're not taking the money out of your business. You might now earn an income, sure, but you actually, you're using that capital to grow your business. So that's why I'm a little bit allergic to trying to figure out if there's dozens of models on how to evaluate a company. But that's why I'm a little bit allergic. Rather, if somebody tries to evaluate your business, say, look, what is your intention in joining me in this business? Just like you would go when you are, uh, can, can I be very open here, very free, no sensitive ears? Okay, it's the same thing as when you are entering a relationship or dating or wanting to get married or you know, the more less um, more one 24-hour base uh, transaction. Um, everybody has a different agenda. Some investors will want to join you from the stage where you are now until you're ready for the next round of funding when they get bought out. Some investors believe in the long run. They want to stick with you and grow into a large or semi-large company. Some investors are more interested in getting a dividend every month. So again, you've got to find out who you're dealing with. Because you can't just prepare a pitch in isolation and then drop it on the table and say take it or leave it. Which is why we, and I've been through this route as well, looking for funding, are often sitting on a, on a lot of rejections. That's because investors are saying, it's great, I like your business, you're saying all the right things, you've done all the check boxes, but it's not for me. Hence why, you know, it's, if you are approaching a very pretty lady and saying, listen, I would like to marry you and have lots of children and grow a fantastic family and so forth. But she's only interested in the 24-hour transaction. I'm going to get myself into trouble. Um, you're not taking this, are you? Um, no. Sorry. Good. Okay. <laughs> um, we have a 17 year old here. Huh? We have a 17 year old. Well, there's somebody who does child trafficking there. <laughs> I'm sorry. <laughs> and, uh, it's a joke, you know, I always say to everybody, I'm in drugs, gambling, and prostitution, <laughs> stolen cars, money laundering, and weapons. Uh, it, it creates a perception, you know. And, and from there you can only improve. <laughs> but actually, about uh, two years ago, I was speaking in front of 250 people. At, it was an innovation summit. And nobody told me 249 out of 250 were government officials. And I used this opening line. It, I don't know why I'm not in jail. Um, but, sorry, where was it? Yeah. So my point was, depending on what you want to do, you'll have different intentions with the, your involvement in the business. So which is why it's irrelevant what you think my business is worth. Let's rather talk about where we are going with this. What is my capital requirement to grow that business? And no investor is fooled by the idea that with, with an investment of 50,000 rand, you will grow a 10 billion rand company. It will not happen. So be upfront with the people that you're interacting with. Have a concept. I need 20,000 rand to get three pilot phases going and um, two clients. And then from there, we will need to go for a second round of funding to raise maybe 150,000 rand to now scale it up in a proper business. And there we might need more. But the thing is, first, it makes it much easier to raise capital because you're not looking for 150,000 rand. You're looking for small tranches with clear deliverables. And they'll ask you, show me how you're going to use the money. That's why you've got to be realistic. Don't say, no, I'll pay myself 2,000 rand a month, but you know already you're going to struggle if you don't earn 4,500 rand a month. So that's why I'm saying be very open because it's a relationship you're starting with an investor. And in that process, say, look, this is what I'm trying to spend. This is 
where I'm going. This is how much I need. Plus, here are some resources. For example, who did, you did marketing, branding, websites, and business cards. Fantastic. Maybe that investor has access to some resources which are not monetary, but might add incredible value to what you're trying to achieve. And again, often to approach an investor directly, hi, can you just give me money? It creates barriers where all our differences go up. Rather do it the soft way, but it takes time. In my experience, anything between six months and two years to get funding, cash in the bank. So if you're right now destitute, you're fucked. <laughs> I'm sorry. I think I'm going to get kicked out of this place. Um, so that's what I'm saying. Make it a very open relationship, an open transaction. Be very honest about what you're looking for. And if I say, but what's your business worth? You say, it's irrelevant what the business is worth because I'm not taking money out of the business. All the money is left into the company to grow it. Now comes the crux. So how much am I going to get equity-wise? I even did a master's thesis at university where I did a huge research project. Well, let me rephrase it. I told the university I did a huge research project, but I faked half the data. Where I tried to find out how people come up to deciding how to split equity in your business. And you know what? There's absolutely no formula, so don't rack your brains. There's nothing out there that will give you the answer that you're looking for. It's about sitting down and saying what's fair. So you're going to be investing in my business, okay? What is your role in my business? Are you just putting money in and knocking every three months to see how I'm doing? Or are you adding value, bringing me leads, bringing more contracts? Then I'm prepared to give you more equity. Maybe you can make it a step approach and say, tell you what, 20% right now, going up to 35% if you do the following things for me. <coughs> And there's never going to be a perfect decision. And you won't know if you made a perfect decision for the next couple of years. There'll be a phase at the beginning when even your business partner may be perfectly useless. You'll hate them. But they'll become really useful when you enter the next stage. So it's very difficult to forecast what the contribution is of each of the business partners in your business. As far as business partners is concerned, you know when you split? and you do 50-50, I would advise against doing 50-50. You always want to be controlling shareholder, unless you're both sitting here tonight when you are <laughs> in for a very interesting discussion. But again, you can say, right, what are you bringing to the business? What am I bringing to business? If you do a 50-50, there are things like, and they're cheap to get, uh, uh, buy-sale agreement, you, have you heard of them? A buy-sell agreement is essentially saying if you and I are in business together and we don't get along anymore and you think the business now is worth 10 million rand and I should pay you out and I think it's worth 1 million rand mm, that's the other way around we go to him you put 10 million rand on a you put a valuation of a business on a piece of paper and you hide it I put what I think it's worth and I hide it we give it to him as an intermediator if your valuation is 10 million rand you have to pay me out half that keeps the level ground very, very fair. Because in benefits, if you say 1 million, 100 rand, and I say 1 million rand, you split the difference. But all I'm saying is there's lots of little cheap tools that you can use to safeguard you. So don't be too concerned about how you split it and how the valuation is and so forth. At the stage in which we are, or you are right now, and at the rate my business is going, I'll probably be back at that stage too soon. <laughs> Um, it doesn't matter. Don't worry too much about the big picture, huge agreements. Make it straightforward. Go get yourself customers. The first customer, the first three customers. When you have that footprint, it's also easier to persuade somebody to invest in you. Because somebody has already believed in you. And the problems you will have when you have 10 customers or 50 customers or 100 customers are worlds apart to what you have today. Don't worry about them now. Focus on surviving day by day, on bringing some money in the bank so you can pay ESCOM and um, and what are they told? Roads? <laughs> Sunroll. Yeah. I don't, has anybody got uh, invoices from Sunroll as well? I get love letters. Like this. It's incredible. Yeah. 
Okay, so that was, I'm um, sorry, it was a little bit all over the place, but just to keep it a little bit, uh, this is my experiences, both from the funding side, be very open, be honest, say, guys, this is where I am, this is what I need the money for, and it'll take me to here. It won't grow my business into, I'll need more money when I get here. But with that perspective, people believe you more, because they're more realistic, or they believe you are more realistic about the real risks of your business. Okay. I've taken probably more time than I should have. Um, I hope that helps a little bit. Okay, so if there's any questions or any pressing needs or any frustrations, I'm very happy to pass them on to the team here. <laughs> <laughs>